All right, welcome to respiratory. We're gonna start off by doing anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. Um, we're not gonna do the full lecture here because it's mostly review. You should have gotten in anatomy and physiology too. So um, I have a voice thread that you can listen to with all the little details. Um, we're just gonna go over some of the bigger topics of that anatomy and physiology. So uh, the respiratory tract starts at your nose and your mouth, and they connect together in the back at the trachea. So from the trachea, we go down to the bronchi, and you've got two major bronchi, a left and a right. Now, when you get down to the lung side, one of your lungs has two lobes and the other has three lobes. Why does one have more lobes than the other? because it connects to the heart. So your heart is pretty much in the center of your chest and then poking slightly to the left. So to make room for the heart, the left lung only has two lobes. As a result, your bronchi are not symmetrical. Your right bronchi is thicker and shorter, and then your left one is thinner but longer. So the right one is gonna break up into how many bronchi? Three. We call these lobar bronchi. And the reason three is because you have, that's a terrible drawing, but because you have three lobes. On the left side, it's gonna break up into two because you have two lobes. Now, each of your lobes is separated into a certain number of segments and to feed each segment of the lobe, your lobar bronchi will break up into segmented bronchi. Now, you continue to break into smaller and smaller bronchial tree until eventually you end up with what is known as a bronchiole. So the bronchiole feeds what's known as the respiratory unit. Um, the respiratory unit is also known as an asinus. And I don't know what no half asinus jokes around here. Okay, I, just, I guess I just did that myself. That was sad. All right, so the asinus is also known as the respiratory unit. And what you're gonna end up with is this terminal bronchial and then a whole bunch of little grape-like sacs. Now, what are these little grape-like sacs called? They're called alveoli. So alveolus is singular, alveoli is plural. Why do we have all these tiny little air sacs? Wouldn't it be more efficient just to have one big air pocket? It's not about filtering. What do we what do we want to happen to the oxygen in in the air? You breathe the air in, and then you want the oxygen to do what? Go into the blood. So it's got to dissolve in water. Now, what do you know about dissolving things? What increases the rate of dissolving something? Imagine for a moment that you, uh, that you have wanted to put um, some sugar into a drink. Would it be better to have one giant sugar crystal? Or would it be better to have like powdered sugar? Which one would dissolve more easily? The powdered, why? Less mass per surface area. So by having all these tiny little air pockets, we are increasing the surface area, which will increase the efficiency of diffusion. What's the purpose of alveoli? Increase the surface area to increase diffusion of oxygen into the blood. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happens at that junction in a minute. All right, so 
That's the bronchial tree. Start off at your nose and your throat, moving down the trachea. Lobar bronchi, segmented bronchi, smaller and smaller until we end up with the terminal bronchial, which feeds the respiratory asinus, a respiratory, respiratory unit, also called an asinus, which is the bronchial plus the alveoli that it feeds. All right, now as far as defenses of your respiratory system, in your nose, you got nose hairs. Ew! Trim those suckers. What is the purpose of nose hairs? To help filter out air. You also have turbinates. What are turbinates? They're little bony prominences in your nose that help to swirl the air. So instead of the air just going straight in, it swirls and then goes down. What does that swirling do? It helps that if there's any particles, instead of just going straight through into your lung, they get trapped on the side of your nose. Now, the lining of your nose, what kind of membrane is that called? A mucous membrane. So it's gonna be moist. So when those little, air, those little particles in the air touch the side of your nose, that moist mucous membrane, they stick. And then your body produces mucus, which actually helps to thin it out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Now the lining of your trachea and the bronchi themselves, you've got goblet cells. And those goblet cells produce mucus, or in this case we're gonna call it sputum, because you sputum it up, I guess. And then the little epithelial cells have cilia. What are cilia? What's cilia? You don't know. I am hypnotizing you. So cilia are little hairs. That's trying to give you a little uh, hint. So if you expand it, so here's the cells. And they have these little hair-like projections that we call cilia. Now the hairs can move. And so the little cilia act like a crowd surfing elevator. Anyone here ever seen crowd surfing? Anyone here actually crowd surfed? Do you know what crowd surfing is? No. no? It's when you're in a nightclub and you jump up on top of the crowd and they're holding you up in the air and then they like pass you along from person to person. That's called crowd surfing. Most of us have only seen it in movies. It's kind of like a 90s thing, I guess. It was before your time. No, well, anyway. Um, so, the cilia takes little chunks of mucus with stuff trapped in them, and by waving, it crowd surfs that little guy up until you get to this area right here. The very last ring of cartilage of your, bra of your trachea is called the carina. And the carina is heavily innervated and is extremely sensitive. So when this little hunk of mucus and dust touches the carina, what does it induce? Yeah. <coughs> Coughing. Coughing, and you hook it out. Yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so, these, so these are mechanical defenses. They're things that prevent stuff from getting down into the lung itself. Good. So is the carina that little part that you drew where it stops? Yeah, so this will be the last cartilaginous ring. Okay. So if you look at your trachea, if you look at someone's trachea, if you feel it in the front of your neck, there's rings, right? So each of those rings is a little piece of cartilage. So the very last piece of cartilage is called the carina. And it's down about there. <laughs> yeah, not down there. Okay. So that would be the carina. Um, so those are mechanical defenses. They're things that try to physically prevent letting bacteria and particles down into the lung. Once you get down into the lung itself, there's a couple other defenses. There are 
some surfactants, which are substances produced by the lung itself, that have antibacterial properties and that are produced during inflammation. So surfactant D would be an example of that. And there are also macrophages that live in the lung area whose job it is to attack and eat things that come into the lung. So you have um, both immune inflammatory defenses as well as the um, mechanical defenses of the respiratory tract. Now, as far as taking a breath goes, what makes us take a breath? Like what drives you to breathe in the first place? Okay, it's elevated levels of carbon dioxide. So, um, PCO2 is related to pH, and as your blood becomes more acidotic, that induces you to take a breath. So if you want to try this, go down to the lab, put an O2 sat on your finger, take a deep breath and hold it. <gasps> you're, you're like dying for that breath. You got to take another breath. I'm out of breath. I'm out of oxygen. And guess what the O2 sat will be? it won't even have changed at all. So did you need to take a deep, another breath because of oxygen? No, you were still fully saturated with oxygen. Why'd you take a next breath? Because you had had a buildup of carbon dioxide, which made your blood slightly more acidic. So this is what we call the primary drive to breathe. You have an urge to breathe before your oxygen levels ever go low. Now, what happens if carbon dioxide levels are normal, but your oxygen level is low? Could that happen? It could happen. Not under ordinary circumstances, but it could happen. So we have a secondary drive to breathe, which is low oxygen levels. Uh, I guess we should say low PO2. So when the oxygen levels go down, you become hypoxemic, that is also a drive to breathe. That one is not ordinarily engaged for most people. And that's why we call it the secondary drive to breathe. Now in COPD patients, they can have this weird thing happen because they're not very good at exhaling, where their carbon dioxide levels are elevated all the time. So they're living at, you know, say, PCO2 of 48, 52 all the time. At that point, they have to have low oxygen levels in order to take the next breath. So their O2 sats will be like 91, 92, whereas yours are like 97, 98, 99. Now, if you give a COPD patient who's in that stage where they need that low oxygen level in order to take a breath, if you give them too much oxygen, you raise their PO2 level back up to normal levels, they actually stop breathing and die. Um, so you got to be a little bit careful when you give oxygen to that kind of patient. If you give them too much, you can stop them from breathing. So primary drive to breathe because of high carbon dioxide, which in turn is causing acidosis of the blood or a shift toward acidosis. Secondary drive to breathe, usually a backup mechanism, is low oxygen levels. And what kind of patients does the backup system become the main system? Severe COPD patients. Not mild, severe. Could also happen in severe asthma as well, but a little bit less common in asthma. So that is what causes the drive to breathe. So now you've, you've got the drive to breathe. How does the breath actually happen? How do you, how do you breathe? Take a breath. Why did the air come in? Because I breathed. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's see if I can draw this. 
All right, so you've got your bronchial tree coming in. And you've got lungs. And now those lungs are encased in a rib cage, right? And then what's underneath the rib cage? What muscle separates the lungs from the guts? Shaped like an umbrella. Separates the lungs from the, ab from the abdomen. So stomach, intestines are all below this muscle. <laughs> Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology 1. I, I'll, I'll tell you, it's called a diaphragm. Oh. oh, yeah, I knew that. Duh. Uh-huh. You see what we are up against? So the diaphragm. So here's your patient. They've got basically a box that the lungs are living in. Now, when you pull this down and you expand the chest outward, you're expanding the volume of that's available to the lungs, right? Now, for the bonus prize, principles of chemistry. What's Boyle's Law say? Oh, man. Oh, it's something like K equals... PV. What does that mean? What's P? Pressure. Under pressure. Bum 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 bada bum bum. And what does V mean? Vol volume. So it says that pressure and volume are inversely related. So think about this for a moment. If you have a balloon that's blown up to a certain pressure, if you squeeze the balloon, what happens to the pressure? It grows. So as you squeeze the gas in there into a smaller volume, it increases the pressure, right? Yeah. Okay. And if you relax it, what happens to the pressure? It expands. So. When you take this volume of space and you make it bigger by lowering the diaphragm, raising the clavicles, stretching out the abdominal wall to your uh, external intercostals, or is that your intern? Yeah, your internal intercostals. What does that do to the volume of air of space in here? It goes up. What does that do to pressure? It goes down. So you're actually creating a partial vacuum. Now, because you've got this straw that we call a trachea, what happens to the air? The air rushes in. So by making your chest bigger, you're creating negative pressure inside your chest. And then air rushes in through your trachea. That's why you breathe in. Now, why do you breathe out? What do you have to do to breathe out? Relax. When you relax, the, the pressure on your chest increases, and that squeezes the air out. Now, you can also add to that by <gasps> and, and forcefully breathing out, but you don't have to. So expiration under ordinary circumstances is a passive action. Everything just resets back down to normal, and then that pushes the air out. So why do you breathe in? Because of principles of chemistry at class that everyone tells me I never need to know anything. Oh, sorry. Um, I was channeling my inner student for a second there. Okay. So the diaphragm, it contracts downwards. The clavicles pull upwards. And then your intercostals pull outwards. So all of those things work together to increase the amount of space in the, in the rib cage. 
That creates negative pressure, and then air rushes in to fill that negative pressure. Yes. Well, I mean, the whole thing is breathing, but it expands, and that's why the air comes in. Okay. Yes. So weird. True story. Hmm. All right. So at this point, let's talk about what happens when the air gets down into the alveoli. All right, so when the air comes into the alveoli, uh, here is an alveolus. Okay. Okay, so we have air in here. This is the air pocket. So if you want to draw it, more complete. And then here is the blood vessel. So the alveolus is a pocket of air surrounded by blood. Right? Now, what is our goal? Okay, so we want to get oxygen into the blood. That means it's got to penetrate a membrane and then dissolve in water. Now, what is it that drives the dissolving of air, of gas, into water? How many of you have taken scuba? No scubas? All right. So, um, ordinarily, there's at least one person here who's had scuba, so I pick on them because they never remember this stuff, which is sad because, you know, it's the basis of all scuba. But hey, what else? Um, I'll just tell you, what, what governs the uh, dissolution of gas into a liquid is the partial pressure of the gas, in this case oxygen, times the dissolution constant. So the dissolution constant is a property of the gas. Certain gases dissolve more easily in water. So for example, water does not, sorry, oxygen does not dissolve as well in water as carbon dioxide does. So it's really easy for carbon dioxide to pass through and get absorbed. It's really easy for nitrogen to pass through and get absorbed. It's a little bit harder for oxygen. Does that make sense? So what is the partial pressure? Not quite. It's the total pressure times the concentration. So the, what's the, what is the pressure here at sea level? There's a couple ways you can measure it. Pascals or millimeters of pressure. But we can say one atmosphere of pressure. So all of the air above you has weight, right? And so all of the air all the way up into 30,000 feet is pushing down on you right now. So you're under pressure. And it's a good thing because if it weren't there, you couldn't, this wouldn't work. So the concentration of oxygen is, oxygen is about 18 to 20 ish percent of the air we breathe. So we'll just say 20% because it makes our math or, maths easier. So every time you take a breath in, what's the pressure inside your lung? One atmosphere. One atmosphere here at sea level in Florida. If you're up in Colorado, it's less, right? So one pressure, one atmosphere, times 20%. So 0.2 atmospheres of pressure. That's our partial pressure of oxygen. Does that make sense? Now, if you want to push more oxygen in, what is the deciding factor? What are the two things that we can deal with? One is the concentration. So if we put a patient on oxygen, what are we doing? 
put on a little mask. Every time they take a breath in, they're taking in more oxygen as a concentration. So instead of being, say, 0.2, maybe it's 0.4. You can go all the way up to what we call a non-rebreather mask, where a patient is getting 100% oxygen. So the partial pressure in that case, instead of being the total pressure times a fraction, is just the total pressure. Does that make sense? Now, can you go above that? Can you go above 100% oxygen? Or is that maxed out? We've got the concentration is as high as it can go. Can't go higher than 100%. Well, Dr. Heyman, uh, you're asking me this question, so I think the answer is yes. Okay, how would you do that? What do you think? We mucked with the concentration side as high as we can go. If we want to get more oxygen, what do we have to do? Increase the total pressure, hyperbaric chamber. So we do that sometimes for certain wound healing things. Um, wounds heal better in the presence of high oxygen, and so you can actually get more oxygen into a wound by putting them in a hyperbaric chamber. There are, so, there are also some therapeutic uses in terms of treating a patient with certain respiratory problems where you can't get above a certain amount of oxygen. So if we want to increase the amount of oxygen that comes in over on this side, what do we do? We can either increase the pressure or increase the concentration, right? Now, what happens over here in the blood side? What would make it easier to absorb, to dissolve the oxygen into the water? What do you know about diffusion in general? It goes from high concentration to low concentration. So what would you want to do over here to make it easier to pull oxygen in? Lower the concentration. Huh. What if, wait a minute, what if every time a little molecule of oxygen came in, we like sucked it up into this special molecule that was made just to transport oxygen. So now it's no longer in the water part of the blood. Now it's, it's, in, it's in this this molecule. What was that? Hemoglobin? Wait a minute. God already designed this molecule? Doesn't he know I have a patent on it? God is just totally moving in on my business, man. All right. So what is the purpose of hemoglobin then? The purpose of hemoglobin. Here we've got a red blood cell. The moment this oxygen comes in, what we want to do is we want to suck that a little oxygen inside. Now there's a space here that's available for the next oxygen to come inside. So hemoglobin effectively reduces the concentration of oxygen in the water part of the blood, helping to pull oxygen into the blood. So, what kind of person is going to have problem getting enough oxygen into their blood? A person with what problem? Low hemoglobin levels. So the fancy word for that is anemia. So patients with anemia, they don't have enough hemoglobin or enough red blood cells or both. But either way, they don't have enough hemoglobin, so they can't absorb oxygen into the blood as easily. Their blood can't carry as much oxygen. Now there's one more thing that we have to think about in this little dynamic. So we have oxygen in the air side. We talked about the pressure and the concentration. 
we have oxygen on the blood side, and we talked about sucking it up inside of the hemoglobin. But what does it have to cross? A membrane. And what should that membrane be like in order to facilitate the diffusion? Permeable and thin. So what happens if you have thickening of this membrane? What will that do to the diffusion of oxygen? It'll make it harder for it to go through. So fibrosis of the lung, scarring of the lung, makes it harder for blood to go into the alveoli. What happens if there's inflammation in the lung? What are the signs and symptoms of inflammation? Redness, heat, swelling, pain. Now, what is edema? Swelling. What, I mean, like, technically, how does it occur? Say that again? Increase in capillary membrane permeability, which allows fluid to leak into the interstitial space. What happens if we have fluid that is leaking into the alveoli? So now, instead of diffusing into the oxygen going straight into the hemoglobin, it's got to diffuse into the edema, then cross the membrane, then get sucked up by hemoglobin. Do you think that's going to slow down the process? Yeah. So pulmonary edema is going to decrease the amount of oxygenation. Now, Another thing that you might want to think about is we talked about the inflammatory, the, the inflammatory and immune defenses of the lung, right? So imagine that you have a macrophage right here inside the alveoli, and its job is to eat stuff, and it dies. And now its little body is laying up against the side of the membrane. So now the oxygen has to pass through this dead macrophage carcass to cross the membrane to cross into the blood. Is that going to decrease the uh, inflammation? Or sorry, decrease the diffusion of oxygen? Yep. That actually occurs in ARDS that we talked about. If you ever hear the term hyaline membrane, a hyaline membrane is made up of the bodies of dead macrophages lining the alveoli. So anytime you have edema, anytime you have thickening of the alveoli wall, you're going to end up with lower diffusion of oxygen across that membrane. Any questions about that? All right, one last thing we have to talk about, and that is the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. I know you just went, what? So let's talk about that. All right. Hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. So um, this is PO at the bottom, pressure of oxygen. Along the top, we have saturation of oxygen. What do we mean by saturation? how much of the hemoglobin has oxygen on it. So at 100%, every, oxygen, every hemoglobin molecule has as much oxygen as it can possibly carry. At 0%, the hemoglobin has no oxygen. Does that make sense? Now, under ordinary circumstances, once you get up to 80 millimeters of pressure, what you end up with is something that looks like this. Okay, So once you get to 80, how much more saturation do you get? Only the tiniest little bit, right? That's why in your arterial blood gas, 80 is considered normal. Once you get above 80, you're normal. Now, how come there's no upper limit on normal? Because the most you can get at ordinary pressures is one pressure, one atmosphere of pressure times 20%. So the only way to get more oxygen than that is either to give oxygen or to increase the pressure. 
So both of those are medical treatments in this case, or scuba diving. Um, but under ordinary circumstances, that doesn't happen, which is why we say above 80 is normal. And we don't have an upper limit because in normal everyday life, you can't go above that, more or less. Okay. So in the lung, what we want is we want to have lots of saturation. So let's say that this is 97% up here. So when you have lots of oxygen available, what do you want the hemoglobin to do? Saturate like crazy, right? Now, when you go to the tissues, so that little red blood cell goes from the lungs, now it goes down to your heart, or to your muscles, or to your brain. And the partial pressure of oxygen is, say, 40%. Or sorry, 40 millimeters. Now what do you want that little hemoglobin molecule to do? Do you want it to say, no, this is my oxygen, you can't have it. I need to be saturated at all times. Or do you want it to say, oh, you want some oxygen? Here you go. And that's what this dissociation curve is showing, that when there's lots of oxygen around, hemoglobin sucks it up like crazy. But then when you don't have a lot of it in the tissues, it gives it up like crazy. And that's what you want to happen. Now, when you become acidic, that curve is gonna shift. Now, if you're looking at your notes, which direction does it shift? Well, it doesn't really matter because no matter which direction it shifts, it's bad. So let's say if, what happens if we shift it to the right? Okay. If we shift things to the right, it's not going to be as saturated at 80%, uh, 80 millimeters of mercury. So in the lung, when there's lots of oxygen around, it's not going to be as saturated. So then when you get to the tissues, it doesn't have as much to give up in the first place. Does that make sense? So it's better at giving it up, but it doesn't take on enough to be useful. Now, if you shift the other direction, what happens? So it becomes super saturated at much lower, temp at much lower pressures. So it's like, wow, super saturation. But then when you get down to the tissue, it doesn't want to give it up. So both of those shifts are bad. One of them is associated with acidosis, the other one is associated with alkalosis. For this particular class, it doesn't matter which one is which. When you get into complex care, you might need to know which is which. But for now, you just need to know that it's a Goldilocks situation. And under ordinary pH, the oxygen dissociation curve is just right. Does that make sense? All right, any questions about basic anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system? All right, we're gonna talk about respiratory pharmacology. So the first thing we need to talk about with respiratory pharmacology is the difference between inhaled and systemic drugs. So systemic drugs are given to the entire body and then they get to the lung through the blood circulation. Now, one of the great things about your lung is that it has an enormous amount of blood circulating through it. All of the blood in your body circulates through it basically every other beat. You know, so whatever drop of blood goes to the body on the left side of the heart has to come back to the lungs on the right side. So you have an enormous amount of blood flow through it, so it's really easy to get drug to the lungs, giving it systemically. Now what's the downside of systemic drugs being given for respiratory problems? It affects the rest of your body, so you're more likely to experience adverse effects. So the trade-off is when you do an inhaled medication, it's going to be targeted toward the lung and airway, but it might not be able to get there as well. If you have a disease that limits the ability to breathe in or out, that's going to limit your ability, the effectiveness of an inhaled drug. So generally speaking, the more severe a patient is, the more we're going to move towards systemic drugs. The less severe they are, the better we're going to be able to use the inhaled drugs. Now, 
the big advantage of inhaled drugs is fewer adverse effects. So let's talk about the various types of inhaled drugs. The very first one is our handy dandy inhaler, also known as an MDI metered dose inhaler. So for those of you who didn't understand how to spell that, M metered dose D I inhaler. So when a person says my inhaler, you typically think of something like this, and what's the fancy schmancy name for it? Metered dose inhaler. So in this case, um, you've got a little canister of medication, and it goes inside this kind of little plastic thing, and it has a little mouthpiece protector that usually patients lose this after like the second day, but hey, whatever. Um, some of them are very fancy, and they have it like a little counter in the back will tell you how many puffs are left, um, but this one doesn't have that. So the way that you are supposed to take this correctly, breathe in, breathe out, place it in your mouth. And then the idea is to and at the same time. Now, most of us learned how to, well, most of you haven't seen the movie Goonies, but had you seen Goonies, that's where you probably would have learned how to take an inhaler, and it would have looked like this. That is not how you do it. So once the ends, you keep breathing in, right? So it's like this, ready? Now hold it. And now exhale slowly. Why do you want to hold it? Why do you hold it? Okay, so you breathe the medication in, and so here's the little particles, and then you breathe out. What happens to the little particles? They go right back out. By holding your breath, you're giving them a chance to settle against the sides of the bronchi, which will allow them more time to work and be absorbed. So it's important that we make sure that patients hold that breath before breathing out. So again, breathe out and at the same time, you don't stop breathing in after the stops. Count for five seconds and then breathe out. Now, um, we have two major kinds of drugs that we use for respiratory. We have bronchodilators, which make the bronchi larger, which allows more airflow to go through. And then we have anti-inflammatories. If a person has both a bronchodilator and an anti-inflammatory inhaler, which of them should be taken first? The bronchodilator should be taken first because it will make the bronchi larger, which will allow the um, anti-inflammatory to penetrate farther into the airway and be more effective. Now, if a person is supposed to be, take two puffs of their bronchodilator, they need to wait at least one minute between the inhalations. So sometimes you'll see patients do like this. You might as well have just done one. You take one dose, wait about a minute to five minutes, then take the second dose. What that does allows the first dose to begin to work and expand the patient's airway so that the second dose will be even more effective. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a meter dose inhaler. It's what we typically think of when we say inhaler. So an inhaler is a bronchodilator? No, it could be either. It could be either. Yes. Or. Now, what if you have someone who doesn't have enough coordination to and at the same time? Well, now we've got a spacer. So the spacer has a, mouth, a mouthpiece shaped on one end, and that end goes in like this. And then you can pop the other side off. Now, the way that this is supposed to work is you no longer and at the same time. Now you, it's inside here, and now, does that make sense? So you then got it? So with the spacer, you then with just the meter dose inhaler, you and at the same time. So the purpose of a spacer is to allow someone who cannot coordinate 
at the same time to still use their inhaler correctly. Everything else goes the same. Deep breath, you know, breathe out, breathe in all the way, hold it for five seconds, then breathe out again. Any questions about using a spacer? Okay, you'll learn, you'll learn this again in more detail and actually practice it when you do tech skills. The next thing we have is something called a dry powdered inhaler. Um, so in a dry powdered inhaler, what you have is you have a little capsule, which I have the remains of a capsule here. So you have a little capsule that goes into the device and then you press a button and these little things go through and pierce the capsule. So the capsule's got powder in it, dry powder. And then once it's pierced, you just, you breathe out, breathe in, hold your five seconds and then breathe out again. So with a dry powder inhaler, it's very similar, except sometimes patients who aren't used to these will try and push the button and at the same time, and that's not how it works. Push the button, pierces it, and you're done. So most of these dry powdered inhalers are long acting, um, long acting bronchodilators. We'll talk about, about brand names and drugs it, later. So um, this particular one is from Spiriva. It's called a handy inhaler. Um, there's another kind that's like a little bit thinner and longer looking instead of more egg shaped. So they come in different shapes and varieties depending on the drug that is associated with it. Dry powdered inhaler. Now this is another form of dry powdered inhaler called a discus. Um, this is marketed by GlaxoSmithKline, and I'm pretty sure they've got a medical device uh, patent on the device itself. So in this case, you hold it like a little hamburger, and there's a little, butt, little spot here, you put your thumb or your finger, and you open it like this to expose the mouthpiece. It also exposes this little lever. So what you do is you push the lever back, what? Push the lever back, breathe out. I think I'm holding upside down. Yeah, shows me I'm left-handed. There you go. Hold it left-handed, then pop it open, push the lever back, and then breathe. Again, sometimes I have patients who are used to regular inhalers, and they're going, and that's not how it works. So there's a little, there's a little um, disc inside of this thing, and every time you cock the little, the little lever back, it puts a new a new little dose in there. So you cock it, then breathe. Same as, the, um, as this kind of dry powdered inhaler, you wanna breathe out, put it to your mouth, one big breath in, hold it for five seconds, breathe out again. I kinda sound like I'm a broken record, don't I? That's because it's the same. And it's important that people do it correctly. Um, so the Discus um, is usually Advair is the brand that's most commonly associated with Discus, and that's actually a combination of a long-acting bronchodilator and a steroid anti-inflammatory, and we'll talk about specifics later. Then our next and last inhalation device is what's called, is what's called, Oh, she didn't give me the whole thing. Um, it's called a nebulizer. So the word nebulous means cloudy. And so what we're doing is we're taking a liquid drug and we're turning it into a cloud. So there has to be some sort of air source in the hospital, it's gonna be on the wall and you connect the tubing to the wall. It could be a device like this. This is a very old fashioned style device and loud. They have ones that are like the size of like a pack of gum that are really small and quiet and battery operated, but you know, whatever, you got the old one. So you connect it to your air source and then you connect it to a device like this. And the drug, you just twist this open and the drug goes in there. So you can also give just, these are just saline. Um, so you can put saline in there as well if you just want to moisten the patient's lungs or airway. Say they've got a lot of uh, mucus that needs to be coughed up, but it's dry and thick. You can use this to thin it out. But you also have drug that sometimes appears in these little, um, they call them fish or bullets, depending on where you are. I guess it looks like a fish. Uh, anyway, so, Drug can come in this, or just in this case, just normal saline. 
That would go into this little chamber here. You put this back on, and then there's a mouthpiece of some sort. Um, the mouthpiece in this case is a mask. Um, you can use this for like a little kid or for an adult who maybe is too weak to hold it up themselves. Um, but more commonly, you're gonna see a little mouthpiece on here, and the patient holds it to their mouth and breathes it in. Now, these don't work if you don't put it up to your mouth and breathe it in. Sometimes you see patients in the hospital like this. So blah, 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 talking to someone else. And then the, the, you know, the nurse, the respiratory therapist comes back in. Well, did your breathing treatment work? No, it didn't work at all. You, none of it went in your lungs. It all went into the air. Um, usually the mouthpiece on these is about that big. And there's a tiny little bit on this end. And some patients can't breathe enough to keep it from going out the back. So in that case, they have a spacer that is like a long plastic device about that long that gets stuck on the back of there. And that way, as it builds up inside that little tube, <gasps> breathe it all in, let it build up again, breathe it in again. So for those of you who remember in health assessment, you took a breath, you're like, woo, dizzy, too many deep breaths. That's how sometimes patients can feel when they're trying to do this. So that having that little spacer on there allows them not to have to take as many breaths, but still get the medication in their lungs. Any questions about nebulizer? All right, so we've covered the major types of respiratory um, drugs. So now we're gonna talk, or at least in terms of delivery mechanism for inhaled devices, now we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the actual drug classes. So the two broad categories, what were they? Okay, bronchodilators and anti-inflammatories. Now, one of the things that I sometimes have a bad habit of doing is talking about lung. And we're going to, we're going to expand the lung. This drug works in the lung. For the most part, where the drugs work? In the bronchi, technically the airway. So if you hear me say that, you know, albuterol works in the lung, I'm really meaning airway. Does that make sense? Okay. So bronchodilators are the first. Would someone mind uh, turning that light back on? Okay. Now we've actually already learned about most of the bronchodilators, at least how they work. So if you remember back from the very first test, neuro, we had beta agonists, and there's how many types of beta are there? Well, technically there's more, but we only learned two. So beta one and beta two. And we said one heart, two lungs. And we really mean airway. So beta two primarily is in the airway. When you stimulate beta two, what do you get? I don't know. Well, you get bronchodilation, but you also get two other things. What are the two other things? Decreased mucus secretion. Maybe it's just, yeah, it's just something else. But anyway, so those are the big two things. You, so you get bronchodilation and you get decreased mucus, which are helpful for patients who have those issues. So, Beta agonists, the first thing is we have non-selective ones. Non-selective. Now, what's the ultimate non-selective beta agonist? Epinephrine. Epinephrine. Oh, epinephrine. Epinephrine, yeah. Epinephrine is, it affects every adrenergic receptor. So it's the ultimate non-selective. The only time we're going to use epinephrine is in a patient who has what we call status asthmaticus. So status asthmaticus is an asthma attack that does not respond to medical treatment. That has lasted for at least, some sources say 15 minutes, some sources say 20 minutes, so somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes. If the patient has received medical treatment, not they took their inhaler at home, but they went to say the emergency room and it did not respond to the treatment they gave in the emergency room, we consider it status asthmaticus. There's an increased risk of sudden death for patients in status asthmaticus. The treatment of choice is epinephrine. epinephrine. 
ephedrine is also another one. Um, ephedrine is no longer, um, well, it used to be over the counter in terms of, it was also available in a um, herbal form called ma huang, but that is no longer legal. Um, ephedrine can be used to make um, crystal meth, just like pseudoephedrine. They both came from the ma huang plant. Um, so nowadays, if you want to get ephedrine, you have to go to the pharmacy, show them your ID, you have to record your driver's license, and you can only get a certain amount per month. But it is available um, under the brand names Primatine, Mist, and Broncade. Um, some people will use Broncade tablets as a weight loss device. So aspirin, ephedrine, and caffeine together help to promote weight loss by uh, reducing appetite and stimulating metabolism. True story. All right, back to our story. Um, so those are the non-selective ones we're going to talk about. The others, the other two are well, the others are selective. So beta two agonist. I guess I should write the word agonist at the top here. Beta-2 agonists, we have non-selective and selective. What are your two non-selectives? And ephedrine. Now, I can tell you for your test, ephedrine isn't on there. What will be on there? Epinephrine. When do you use it? Status asthmaticus. What is that? When they've been not responding to the treatment the ER. They haven't responded to treatment, and it's been at least 15 to 20 minutes. And why is that important? increased risk of sudden death. All right, so for the selective beta-2 agonists, we're going to break them into immediate and long-acting. So the short-acting or immediate-acting can be used as rescue inhalers. What does that mean? I have symptoms right now. I have shortness of breath. I need to, be, I need to get relief right now. What, what would you take? Short-acting beta-2 agonist. So the number one is albuterol, which I can't spell. Oh, I, I didn't actually mean I couldn't spell it. I just uh, can't talk and spell at the same time. But thank you. Um, so albuterol. Albuterol is the one that everyone knows if they either had asthma or has a friend who has asthma, chances are they're on albuterol. It is the most common rescue inhaler. It's also available in nebulizers. It's not available in any of these other things. So it's either an inhaler or a nebulizer. Is nebulizer like its own treatment as well? Or is it only yeah, ne you can use nebulizers both in the hospital and at home. They're typically used in either children who don't have enough coordination for this or in elderly folks who need a higher level of, of um, delivery. Now, studies show, research studies show that this can be as effective as this as a delivery device if you use this correctly. And how many people use it correctly? So in practice, this is going to be a better delivery, delivery device for most people. But if you can teach them how to use it right, which I taught you guys right, and you can teach your patients right, this can be just as effective. Does that make sense? Okay. But I mean, just this is giving you one little, and this you're breathing in for five minutes. So you've got a lot more chance to breathe this in. Okay. Um, so albuterol is the, you know, the original one, and it's the one everyone thinks of. Now, there's another version called leave albuterol. So albuterol is a um, racemic mixture. What does that mean? Oh, he's a mime. Yeah. So a racemic mixture means you got left and right hand of the drug. So what is leave albuterol? It's the left hand only. Well, that's my left hand. Uh, your left hand. So, so only one hand, and supposedly it's a little bit more effective and has a little bit less adverse effect than albuterol by itself, the racemic mixture. So you, 
Um, Levi Buterol is more than uh, 15 years old now. It's probably close to about 20 years old now in terms of being broadly marketed. So it's probably coming off patent if it hasn't already and will probably be more and more available as it becomes cheaper and there's more generics available. Um, with these two drugs, the number one adverse effect are going to be sympathetic response. So people would feel um, anxious, so might have um, uh, tachycardia or palpitations. Now, some patients have told me that they only get those kinds of adverse effects when they take generic versions of their inhaler, but when they do the brand name, like uh, Ventolin or Proventil, that they actually don't have those symptoms. Now, that's just anecdotal, but for whatever it's worth, some people have told me that. So if you have a patient who has adverse effects and they're taking the generic, you might want to have them try paying a little bit more, getting the brand name, and see how that works for them. All right, so albuterol and leave albuterol, what is their major claim to fame? What kind of inhaler will they be? Yes, but what, what, do, we use, what are we gonna use it for? Rescue inhaler. So, also short acting is what's used for PRN. If you have symptoms that you want to resolve now, you use a rescue inhaler. If you think you might die from not being able to breathe, what do you use? Rescue inhaler. All right, then we have long acting. Um, these are sometimes abbreviated as LABA. What does that stand for? What is LABA? <laughs> Long acting beta agonist. Beta agonist. Yep. So long-acting beta agonist. These are drugs that will last about 12 hours. Depending on the drug, they start working somewhere between two minutes and 30 minutes. But even the one that's you that starts working in two minutes is not used as a rescue inhaler. Now, if you look at the, the drug label, the drug information, the package insert for one of these drugs, there will be a what's called a black box warning, which is the highest warning level available from the FDA. And it will say, warning, use of these types of drugs in a patient with asthma may lead to increased risk of sudden death. Because there was a study that showed that patients who were on a long-acting beta agonist who had asthma were more likely to die of sudden death than the patients who weren't. And what they think happened is back then you had rescue inhaler, long-acting beta agonist. <laughs> Dead. Because they took the wrong one. The thinking is that they were taking the wrong one by accident. So. Long-acting beta agonists are never available in this. They are only available in dry powdered inhaler or discus. And that's to avoid patients taking the wrong inhaler by accident. So um, two drugs sell, well, two that we're going to talk about anyway, salmeterol and formoterol. There are a couple newer ones. I'm drawing a blank on it at the moment, but it's in a drug called Brio, which you ever watch TV, they're showing commercials for Brio all over the place. But um, anyway, salmeterol and formoterol. Salmeterol is what's in a discus, and formoterol is what's in the other version of the dry powdered inhaler that's this little tablet model, capsule model. Any questions about beta agonists? Well, salmeterol is in combination with, it's in, in the Advair discus, so, yeah. So salmeterol, formoterol. All right, the next thing that we have is anticholinergics. Now, coming back to our little airway here, when it comes to um, parasympathetic receptors, what are the parasympathetic receptors in the bronchi? 
What are they? What was the name of them? There's only one, so. Mu Muscarinic. So you've got muscarinic receptors in the airway. When those muscarinic receptors are stimulated, what do you get? Bronchodilation. Not bronchodilation. The opposite. the opposite, which would be bronchoconstriction and increased mucus. So remember this. Acetylcholine always makes muscles contract and it always makes glands secrete. So when you activate the muscarinic receptors here, you're going to get secretion of mucus and you're going to get contraction of the muscle, so bronchoconstriction. So when we block muscarinic receptors, what do we get? The opposite. We get the opposite, bronchodilation and reduced mucus. So that is fantastic for a disease characterized by bronchoconstriction and reduced mu and increased mucus. And that would be called chronic bronchitis. So the number one treatment for chronic bronchitis is anticholinergics. So drug names, you've already learned ipratropium. Ipratropium is available in combination with albuterol in an inhaler called Combivent. Combivent can be used as a rescue inhaler because it's got albuterol in it. And then it can also be found in Nebulizer. Um, the drug by itself is called Atrovent. I'm not sure if it's available by itself as an inhaler, but I think it might be. But maybe it was pulled off after they did the whole long-acting beta agonist thing. So, Ipratropium. Then, I'm going to tell you another one, tyotropium. Tyotropium. Oh, um, so albuterol lasts about four to six hours, and so does um, ipratropium. Tyotropium lasts much, much, much longer. And the reason I'm telling you its name is because it's what comes in this particular device right here. So. In the dried powder inhaler, the handy inhaler is this is what you get tyotropium in. The brand name is called Spiriva. Nebulizer and inhaler, combi vent combined with um, albuterol. Now, now that I've taught you tyotropium, tyotropium, I'm going to tell you it's not on your test. Shut up, Dr. Raymond! <laughs> yes, ma'am. Is it Is that how long it is? Um, I can't remember exactly how long it is offhand. But I'm sure you can look it up. Oh, we're almost done with our time. All right. So we'll, we'll go just a little bit longer to finish this up, and then we'll head out, because about 15 minutes. Um, so ipratropium and tyotropium. Um, when these are given, um, inhaled, there are very, very few adverse effects. So even though, yes, technically you can have all the anticholinergic effects we talked about earlier in the class, you're probably not going to see them when you use them in this way. All right, the last bronchodilator um, class is called methylxanthines. Some of you guys are going to be very um, what's the word? Innovative in your misspelling of methylxanthines. <coughs> so methylxanthines are similar to caffeine. They're a stimulant like caffeine. They can be associated with heart palpitations like caffeine. They can cause high blood pressure like caffeine. But one of the things they can also do is cause bronchodilation. So these drugs are very old. They're not that effective, so they're considered what's called third line. What does third line mean? Well, your first line would be drugs like this. Second line might be a drug like that, or the other way around. And then third line would be, well, neither of those is working enough. Let's try something in addition. 
So it's not something you just start a patient on. It's something that they eventually might have to go on if nothing else is working well enough. So the drug names are theophylline and am aminophylline, aminophylline. Um, so what do you need to know about them? They're bronchodilators, they're third line, and they can cause heart palpitations. All right, that is it for bronchodilators. Any questions about bronchodilators? So on the test, chances are you might only have one question about this, whereas you might have several questions about these. And the only question I'll have about the non-selective will be about epinephrine. epinephrine. OK, so let's talk about the anti-inflammatories. All right, so for anti-inflammatories, um, the best anti-inflammatories in terms of the strongest is always going to be st steroids. <laughs> always, always, always steroids. Now, we've got two choices. We can give it either systemically or we can give it inhaled. So for systemic, Usually what you're going to see is either prednisone PO or IV methylprednisolone. When a patient comes into the hospital with an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, COPD, the drug that's going to be given almost always is going to be IV methylprednisolone. Now, when it comes to inhaled, there's a whole bunch of them. And the only one we're going to learn is fluticasone. So um, there's others. So if, um, if you go to like Walmart or CVS, Walgreens, and you go to the nasal allergy section, you'll see nasal allergy sprays that are steroids. And you'll see um, triamcinolone, nasacort. Well, that becomes asthmacort when you breathe it in for your lungs. You'll see um, rhinocort, which is budesonide. And that becomes pulmacort when you breathe it in for your lungs. So there's a whole bunch of others. We're just not going to learn them at this time. So as a representative, we're going to learn fluticasone, which the nasal equivalent of fluticasone is nasonex. Sorry, that is not right. That's, um, anyway, lies. Um, <laughs> let me just say that again. <laughs> The nasal version of fluticasone is Flonase. So um, the important thing when you do inhaled steroids, we've already talked about one important thing, which is which, which inhaler do you use first, the uh, bronchodilator or the anti-inflammatory? Bronchodilator. bronchodilator. So the first thing is you use your bronchodilator before you use your fluticasone. The second thing that's important is that after you take the inhaled steroid, you need to rinse your mouth out. Two adverse effects can occur if you don't. The first one is called dysphonia, which means hoarseness. So you might wake up the next day and you can't talk very well. And the other adverse effect is thrush. What is thrush? Candidiasis. Oral candidiasis. So yeast infection of the mouth. Um, as an anti-inflammatory, it can reduce your body's immune response. And if you leave it sitting on, the, on your mouth, well, that will allow yeast a chance to come up and grow where they ordinarily wouldn't be growing. So the, you can avoid both of those things most of the time by doing what? Rinse your mouth out. So generally speaking, you should rinse twice. First one, you rinse and spit. Whatever was in your mouth is now out of your mouth. The second, you rinse and swallow. Why would you rinse and swallow? Because some of it's in your esophagus. And by rinsing it, it goes down into your stomach. So that way, you don't get thrush in your esophagus. Um, most of the adverse effects when it comes to inhaled steroids comes from any time you inhale a drug, some of it goes into your stomach, too. And then it gets absorbed locally. Um, how, many, how many smokers do we have in the class? Have you ever tried smoking before? Well, the, the first time a person smokes, typically what happens is they go, oh, 
because they burn their throat because they, they sucked in too hard. And then they learn how not to do that. And then they feel sick to their stomach because half of the smoke went into their stomach. So when you inhale, it, it takes work to learn how to inhale correctly. So when you inhale a drug, some of that drug is going into your stomach. And that's where most of the adverse effects are coming from is it's being absorbed systemically. Um, that's it for fluticasone. Any questions? All right, next we have leukotriene inhibitors. Do you notice how we're going faster? You want to know why that is? No, it's because we've already learned all about steroids, which means that any question about steroids is fair game. Oh, man. So we're not going to entire re-lecture that part. I just expect you to go back and review it. And, or Hey, don't review it. Just know it. No, OK, review it. That's how you remember it. Um, so leukotriene inhibitors. Now, does this look familiar? Arachidonic acid becomes prostaglandins through cyclooxygenase, right? Well, if you give it yet another enzyme, it'll become leukotriene. What's the name for an inflammatory mediator that changes the behavior of other cells? A cytokine. Leukotriene is an inflammatory cytokine. It's very, very much associated with um, respiratory inflammation. So by inhibiting leukotrienes, you can reduce the amount of respiratory inflammation that you have. Now, when a mast cell degranulates, how many substances are released? When a mast cell degranulates, how many substances are released? So at least 17. So targeting just leukotriene turns out it doesn't really work that well. Some patients it works pretty well for, but most patients are like, meh, didn't do much. Um, so there's several different drugs. Some of them inhibit the enzyme. Others block leukotriene receptors. But in the end, they both have the, the effect of reducing leukotriene activity. The most effective one is the one we're going to learn, and that is Montelicast. Also known as singular. Get it? It's like singular, but it's singular. Oh man, that's so clever. Anyone here ever bid on singular? Did it work for you? I can't remember. Can't remember. Right. Yeah, a lot of patients are like, nah, I can't, I'm not sure. It might work. Yeah. So usually Singular is not the drug that a patient's going to be on by itself, but it might be a drug they're on in addition. Now, the third type of anti-inflammatory is a drug that works so poorly, I don't even like to talk about it, but for whatever reason, they like to put it on standardized tests. And that is uh, mast cell stabilizers. The whole idea is that by stabilizing a mast cell, you won't have as many allergic reactions, so therefore you'll have fewer asthma attacks. Um, they don't really work very well at all, but they can be used sometimes for exercise-induced asthma. For some reason, in some patients, exercise causes an asthma attack, and you can use those kinds of drugs to prevent. When's, when would you take the mast cell stabilizer to prevent exercise-induced asthma? Before. before you exercise. So the drug name there is chromalin. And that's all you really need to know about chromalin. Doesn't work very well at all, except maybe for some patients who have exercise-induced asthma. All right, on that note, we have covered all the respiratory drugs except for cough suppressants. Um, so opioids are your strongest cough suppressant. The two drugs that are typically used for that, codeine and hydrocodone. Next, you have um, dextromethorphan, which is abbreviated DM. 
Right. So dextro, meh, thor, fan. This is available over the counter. And anytime you see a drug that ends in DM at the drugstore, it's got dextromethorphan in it. So Robitussin, DM. Mucinex, DM. What's the DM stand for? Dextromethorphan. Uh, it works pretty well, but a lot, of the a lot of the drugs that you get over the counter don't have a very high dose. So you kind of have to take a higher dose to get a really good effect. If you take a really high dose, it kind of makes you drowsy. And maybe maybe feel weird. So sometimes kids, you know, buy bottles of the stuff and chug it, trying to get high. So just so now they're like, oh, maybe we need to ban dexamethorphan, make it a controlled substance. Like it doesn't make you high. It's just kids will try anything when you don't let them get the ganja. Anyway, um, never mind. That's a whole other story. But. You know, kids will try almost anything to get high for some reason, but it doesn't mean that the substance is dangerous or addictive or needs to be banned. So just say no to banning drugs that don't need to be banned. That's what I say. Um, so anyway, dextromethorphan. One thing to note about dextromethorphan is it goes through the CYP2D6 microsomal enzyme system. <laughs> Do you remember what that means? The cytochrome P450 microsomal enzyme system. So the CYP2D6 subsystem has a lot of other drugs that go with it. So one of the things to be aware of, especially if you go on to become a nurse practitioner, is anytime you give dextromethorphan or you have a patient with a cold, the dextromethorphan has a lot of potential interactions with other drugs. All right, the last one. The last one is called benzonitate. And the brand name is Tessalon, sometimes called Tessalon pearls because they look like little translucent pearls, although they're yellow, not pearly, whatever. Um, so this is a local anesthetic that numbs the cough receptors in your stomach. Yes, you have cough receptors in your stomach. The important thing is they should not be crushed or chewed. They need to be swallowed whole. Any questions about Teslon pearls? All right, and the very, very last thing is expectorants. <coughs> An expectorant is a drug that helps you cough something up. None of them are very effective. The most effective one is called guaifenesin, which is available over the counter. So if you take a drug like Robitussin or um, Mucinex, the major ingredient in it will be guaifenesin. And if it's the DM version, it'll have guaifenesin plus dextromethorphan. And the idea there is you cough less, but when you do cough, you cough something up. Um, guaifenesin doesn't really work unless you have the patient hydrate adequately, but guess what is probably one of the best expectorants there is? Hydrating adequately. So some people say, well, it doesn't really work, but if it's a magic feather that gets them to drink more water, okay, take the drug. You know what else works pretty well? Go in the shower and breathe in the mist. Also hydrating. All right, on that note, we are done with respiratory drugs, and next time we're going to start off with um, the second packet of, of um, respiratory disease notes, the ones that starts off with ARDS. All right, see you guys next week. Yeah, I know. Is that not part of the combination? Brio is a combination, but I haven't made you guys memorize it yet. I just mentioned it in class, but I didn't go over it. Yeah. That's nah, all right. If you want to learn it, you can learn it. And I'll put it on your test. <laughs> all right. See you guys next time.